Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of Astro at Home. My name is Julie. I run the program Discover the Universe. I know many of you have been with us since day one or have been with us for many days. This is uh, an initiative we started now that schools are closed. So we can have you can we can share with you interesting astronomy information while you're at home. This is meant for kids directly, so you can ask questions in the chat on YouTube. We'll be moderating the chat. Please try to keep the discussion related to the subject or to, to astronomy questions um, and stay nice to each other, please. Um, okay, so we will uh, continue next week. Some of us, uh, some of you have been asking us, we will continue next week, many different subjects, lots of great guest speakers. And I am very pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Charles Woodford from the University of Toronto. He's gonna talk to us about a fascinating subject. So I'm gonna wait for Charles to appear. Hi. <laughs> Hi, there you are. Perfect. Hey, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us for this session. Of course, my pleasure. So awesome. I will uh, leave you. We're going to be in the background. Lindsay's in the background as well, moderating the chat, and I will be sending you questions. So thanks, everyone, for being there and um, enjoy the presentation. Awesome. So as Julie said, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Charles Woodford. I'm CJ for short. If that's what you want to address me as on the YouTube chat, it's all good. And I'm going to be talking about listening to the universe, and in particular, how we can listen to the universe through gravitational waves. Um, for a little bit more details about me, just real quick, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto in the physics department, and my actual designation is in the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Um, just so you know who, who, who's speaking, I suppose. So as you've probably been hearing in a lot of the other talks through Discover the Universe, uh, Astro at Home, it was a lot about looking at the universe or trying to see what's out there. And gravitational waves, what we're gonna get into what those are in just a minute, are a really interesting way to not see the universe, but hear it. Uh, and gravitational waves have been called sirens of the universe uh, in the past. So let's right, move on through. You may have heard of gravitational waves before, especially if you're a super keen astro person. And even if you're not, you might have heard it in the news, especially in, in and around uh, 2015 and 2016. So the LIGO scientific collaboration um, did detect gravitational waves in 2015 and fully announced it in February of 2016. And so we're gonna get into what does that really mean? Why was it a big deal? And why did it make so much press news? So in order to answer those questions, we're gonna have to start at the beginning. The very first thing we need to think about when we talk about gravitational waves, well, think about the first word, gravitational, probably has something to do with gravity. So the first thing we need to think about here is gravity and best person to talk to about that would be Albert Einstein. Of course, Einstein's theory of general relativity really put gravity theory and our understanding of gravity into perspective. Um, so the idea with gravity and what we call Einstein's universe or general relativity is that space-time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time, oh, sorry, space-time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to curve. So the important thing about space-time curving is that in those curves, matter moves through them. So you can kind of think of space-time in this way as a big rubber sheet, or if you're someone who has a trampoline or you've been on a trampoline before, um, when you stand or sit in the middle of the trampoline, the trampoline bends. And in the same way that that trampoline will bend when there's someone or something on it, so does space-time. That's what we call curving or space-time curving due to matter or mass or something existing in that space. So anything with matter is going to cause space-time to curve. And when space-time curves, it also changes the things move. This counts for things like the Earth causes space-time to curve, and we stay on the Earth due to its gravitational pull, which is because of that curve in space-time. And you can also think about it in terms of, say, the sun. The sun is really big, right? Much, much bigger than the Earth. And so the sun causes space-time to curve a lot. The Earth follows that curve in space-time around the sun, and that's why we orbit around the sun. So that's a quick lesson on the solar system. Might be a little bit more complicated than that, but that's our brief introduction to space-time and 
this idea of space-time telling matter how to move and matter telling space-time how to curve. But we're not really talking about any kind of curvature when we talk about gravitational waves. Gravitational waves themselves are ripples in space-time caused by changing gravitational fields. Now, there's a few words here that we haven't introduced. We haven't really talked about gravitational fields yet. I've, obviously, gravitational waves are going to have to do with gravity, but what is a gravitational field? Well, the gravitational field is kind of that reach, how much that matter is telling space-time how to curve. That curvature in space-time is the gravitational field. I'm going to talk about how many gravitational waves happen in a week in just a second. That's a good question. <laughs> Um, in particular, gravitational waves, everything causes gravitational waves. Matter moving through space-time causes gravitational waves. So matter tells space-time how to curve, space-time tells matter how to move, but that matter moving through space-time causes ripples in space-time. Now, if you're able to do so and if it's safe, I am not going to suggest that you hit anyone around you when you do this, but everyone put your hands up in the air. Just Put your hands up real fast for those of you who are watching live. And I want you to take a second to shake them back and forth. Shake them back and forth as fast as you can. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Okay. So your arms are made out of matter and we exist in space time. Your arms moving through space time, what you just did, waving them back, back and forth real fast, caused gravitational waves. So I can't actually answer that question of how many gravitational waves happen in a week because they happen consistently all the time uh, and they never stop. The difference here is how strong is that gravitational wave and can we hear it? Of course, even when we think about our human hearing, there are sounds that we can't hear. They're just too low or too high or something is off that we're not able to hear it. And that's same, the same thing is the, is the truth for gravitational waves when we try and listen to them. So listening to gravitational waves, they need to be loud enough for us to hear them in the first place. The only objects in the universe that make gravitational waves loud enough for us to hear are made by what we call compact objects or dense objects, objects a lot like black holes, which you learned about yesterday. So thinking about black holes, there's a lot of matter in a very small amount of space. That's what we call compact, a lot of stuff in a very small amount of space. And their compactness causes a big curvature, a really strong gravitational field in spacetime and when they orbit around each other, you have two black holes and they're orbiting around each other, that causes really, really strong gravitational waves, really strong ripples in space-time. And that's kind of what I'm showing here on the screen with these two compact objects orbiting around each other. These two in particular aren't black holes, but they're, they're showing you what would happen when two very, very um, compact objects move around each other. That's just our understanding of space-time. What did this look like if they actually hit Earth? Well, this is an image of Earth, and these green things moving across the screen are the gravitational waves moving through space-time. Now, I will very much point out that on the bottom left-hand part of the screen, it says the scale of effect is vastly exaggerated. If our gravitational waves were this strong, um, <laughs> we would detect them, but the Earth might not be there anymore. Uh, these are these. This is a very vastly exaggerated scale. So the idea of gravitational waves as they move through space-time, they kind of change distances between objects as they move, which in this case is causing the Earth to wiggle. And in terms of how fast, answering this question that just came up on the chat, answering how fast they move, we're not completely sure. There's a lot of research being done in terms of how fast does gravity move in general, and that actually directly links to how fast do gravitational waves move as well. We think, we think they should move at the same speed that light moves. So at the speed of light is our best guess. But there's still a lot, there's still a lot of research needs to be done to really solidify the answer. So now we have an idea of what gravitational waves are and what causes them and that they happen around us all the time, but it's only the ones that are really loud that we can really detect. So I just wanna highlight one more time, like ripples spreading in a pond, by the time gravitational waves reach Earth, they are incredibly weak. So even the really, really loud ones, by the time they reach Earth, they tend to be really, really soft or really low or really weak. 
And so to detect them, you need to measure movements that are less than one one thousandth the size of a proton. And so this directly answers one of the questions that came up. If you drop a stone into the water and it makes a ripple, would that kind is, oh, wow, there's a lot of words there, okay. But yes, dropping a stone in the water and causing ripples is exactly the same type of physics that happens with space-time rippling and for gravitational waves, at least in terms of an analog discussion about it. So very next thing is, well, what is a proton? So in atoms, which are the building blocks of matter, you tend to have, a proton, which is a positively charged particle, really, 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 really small, and an electron, which is a negatively charged particle. There's all kinds of particles out there, and this isn't really a discussion on particle theory, but what I want to highlight is that all of the compounds and elements that make up matter, that make up you and the computer you're probably watching this on, and everything in your house, water, everything, is made up of elements and various compounds, and those elements are made up of atoms. Atoms, in turn, are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And the protons are the positive ones. So on the very next slide, we're going to see just how small that is, one one thousandth of a proton, the building blocks of the building blocks of matter. So this is a hydrogen atom, one electron and one proton. So every grid is 10 times smaller as we go closer and closer into that proton, 10 times smaller, 10 times smaller, 10 times smaller. And this is how big a gravitational wave is when it hits Earth. And that's as big as they are. So that's pretty small. And just to give you an idea, medical uh, instruments can't make detections this small, which are, usually, which are usually seen as the most sensitive instrumentations we have. So in order to see, or rather hear gravitational waves, you need to have a very, very sensitive detector. And you have to be really, really clever to think about how are you gonna construct it and how are you going to hear those signals that you know are there. This leads us to the detectors that actually hear these signals, which are LIGO and Virgo. So LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And there's actually two detectors in this particular collaboration. There's one in Hanford, Washington, and one in Livingston, Louisiana. Each of these detectors have two arms or two tubes that stick out of them. And each one of those tubes is four kilometers long, really, really big. So the photos might be, might be deceptive, but these uh, institutes, these detectors are really, really huge. Virgo is an interferometer that is in Santa Stefano, Maserata and Cassina, which is just outside of Pisa or where the Leaning Tower of Pisa is in Italy. And it's built the exact same way with two arms or two tubes sticking out of it. And the ones in Virgo are three kilometers long. So to give you an idea of just how large these are, this is the one in Louisiana. I'm gonna turn off the sound. This is showing you the tubes for the one in Louisiana from a drone. Really, really long tubes. So what happens in these tubes? How do we hear the gravitational waves? I do see the questions on the chat. And I'm gonna to get to those in a second. I'm gonna finish describing just how these detectors work. So, in each of these arms, in each of these tubes that are connected to LIGO as well as Virgo, and any interferometer we use are, well, lasers. Laser is part of the name, right? Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. So what happens is lasers are shot down each one of these tubes using something that's called a beam splitter. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like in just a second. So this beam splitter splits the laser in two pieces. They go down each of the arms, they reflect off mirrors at the end and come back. The idea is that if the arms are exactly the same length, and they are, they've been built to be exactly the same length, then when the lasers come back, they cancel each other out and there's no leftover laser. If they're not the same length, well, then you have a detection because that means a gravitational wave has passed through and caused one of your arms to become longer or shorter than the other one. So how does this work inside LIGO? So at the main part, you have your laser that comes out, it hits this mirror in the middle, which is a beam splitter, and then it hits both mirrors at the end, reflects, and if these lasers, as they go down and reflect on the mirror at the very end of those tubes, if the arms are exactly the same length, which is, the sh which is, sh which, which is what's showing right now, 
they'll completely cancel each other out and there's no leftover laser. So that's great. It means their arms are the same length. But if a gravitational wave is passing through, the distances between the mirrors and the beam splitter change. And as they change, they allow some laser to be left over. And that laser part that's left over is what we call a detection. So that confirms that there's been a gravitational wave that's passed through. Of course, with the assumption that there wasn't any noise to begin with. So this is part of the struggle with listening to the universe. I already mentioned that gravitational waves are really, really weak by the time they reach Earth. And the detections themselves are really hard to do. Building an interferometer, a lot of things can actually change the distance between these two mirrors in the arms. In particular, people stomping around upstairs can change it. Trucks driving by. And on a more serious note, things like earthquakes or seismic events, like the crust on the earth shaking a little bit. And that happens all the time. So all of these, all of this noise directly affects how well you can hear these gravitational waves. So one thing you can do to make sure that you're actually listening to a gravitational wave and not some random noise is to one, have lots of detectors. And we have three that are currently in complete operation. The two ones with LIGO and the one with Virgo. The second thing you can do is have a template or rather know what you're looking for. Have an idea of the shape or what something sounds like or what it should sound like so that when you're listening for it, you can pick it up faster. What I'm showing here is such a template or an example of what a gravitational wave should show up as in our detector. The orange lines are the actual data. That's what you should see if you were a technician working at LIGO. In the bottom left-hand corner is a simulation of what this wave looks like if it was really two black holes are running around each other. So it answer comes a couple of the questions that have popped up here. Um, if there wasn't any gravity on Earth, well, we wouldn't we wouldn't live and we wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, gravity is an is a, a part of matter. You can't have matter without gravity. All matter, anything with mass, has a gravitational pull, or or it has a gravitational force, or a curved space time. Remember at the beginning when we talked about that. So everything has gravity. And if Earth just lost its gravity, the gravity was turned off. Well, we'd go flying into space and probably fall into the sun. Yes, yeah, so we wouldn't be here. <laughs> So that's not, that's not a fun question, but thank you for asking it. Um, how strong is gravity? Well, gravity is actually considered the weakest force, um, and, which is ironic. Uh, if you ever learn about the four fundamental forces of nature, you'll understand the joke. But gravity is considered uh, the weakest force because in close quarters um, and with things that are like our mass, so like people on the range of 100 kilograms or so, uh, gravity doesn't have a big effect. We're more so concerned with, say, um, electricity and magnetism and that sort of thing. When you get to astronomy, however, gravity plays a really big effect because everything you're talking about is really, really massive or has a lot of mass. So it depends kind of on what you're talking about as well as how far away they are. Gravitational waves do indeed affect Earth. They change distances as things move through them. You saw the clip earlier about gravitational waves passing through Earth, uh, but of course that was a fast exaggerated. So gravitational waves don't affect us on our day-to-day -day lives, but they do affect the space-time that we exist in. The laser cannot go through the mirror. It only goes through the beam splitter. And are there more than one type of gravitational wave? Yes. Yes, there are, and we're gonna get to that in a second. Um, I'm gonna skip a couple of these questions because I'm gonna address them in just a minute, but how fast gravitational waves? We think they're the same, we think, we think they travel at the speed of light, but it, as I said before, that's an active research question and we're not completely sure. Um, but chances are they do travel at the speed of light. All right, so let's move on here. So we know that we have detectors that listen for gravitational waves. They're very, very sensitive, but there's a lot of noise that happens that makes it difficult to listen for these waves. And so one thing that we can do to help those detectors hear gravitational waves is to have what we call a template or know what you're looking for. So 
when we make these gravitational wave templates or what we know the signal to look like or here, on the bottom of the screen is what the detector should actually be listening for. And on the top of the screen is what this particular gravitational wave template looks like when it's two black holes in space-time. The colors on the space-time reflect how strong the curvature is. So you've got two black holes, they've merged, and all of those ripples that are going away from the black hole now are those gravitational waves, are the ripples in space-time. And I believe you may have seen this before you saw an image from it. This is what two black holes orbiting around each other emitting gravitational waves would look like if we could see them from Earth. So you have the two black holes in the middle. They're warping space-time. They're curving space-time a lot. They're orbiting around each other. So matter moving through space-time creates gravitational waves. And we see, especially around the corners of the, vi of the video, that everything's kind of shifting and wiggling. And that was the gravitational waves causing space-time to wiggle. So now we know what we're listening for. We know how to listen for them. Did we actually see them? And the answer is yes. The very first one that was ever heard or discovered as, I, as we say it was GW150914, which means gravitational wave event seen on September 14th of 2015. And it was fully released to the public that LIGO saw GW150914 or, very, or the first time ever saw gravitational waves or listened for gravitational waves um, in February of 2016. That was when they released it. Uh, they needed to be really, really certain that they did indeed hear a gravitational wave and it wasn't some random noise that happened. So on the bottom of the screen here is showing you what that gravitational wave looked like in the detector and that, and uh, the orange line is the one from Livingston, and the blue one is the one from Hanford. So when we listen for gravitational waves, we know that there's going to be three distinct parts of that gravitational wave. We expect an in-spiral when the black holes are away from each other and they're getting closer. Merger, which is when the black holes are colliding together. That's the really strong part of the signal, the really loud part. And the very last part of the signal is what we call the ring down, when the very last gravitational waves are echoing away. All right. Just a quick note about some of these questions. Is there another way to measure gravity? Is there another way to measure gravitational waves? Yes, but they have not been successful. So I'm going to skirt over that question. I apologize for that. Um, because the laser interferometer method has been shown to be the most effective because we've actually seen gravitational waves with those. Um, other methods for, for seeing or listening for gravitational waves have not proven effective. Um, as far as we know, gravitational waves don't travel at different speeds, but again, open fields of research, we're not sure on that yet. Gravitational waves are technically invisible. You can't see them with your eyes, which is why we say we hear them. Uh, we say we hear them because they travel through space-time as opposed to on top of it. Like all the starlight we see, even the stuff that's shown in the background of this particular slide is seen. It travels over space-time. Gravitational waves travel through space-time, which means we can't see it. But those wiggles, you can think about as vibrations and you can always hear vibrations. We don't think gravitational waves start in a specific place, but all the ones that we've seen have been happening outside of our galaxy. Um, or at least all the ones from binary black holes we've seen from outside of our galaxy, from two black holes orbiting around each other. And do gravitational waves hit other planets or just Earth? Gravitational waves are emitted essentially in a sphere uh, or in all directions rather. So gravitational waves will go out in all directions uh, from the binary black hole or whatever is causing it. And so everything is affected by them all the way out to the edge of the universe and back. What we're looking for when we, when we try and find them from Earth is, well, can we pinpoint where they are hearing them here on Earth? But if there was another alien civilization somewhere out there, they would also be hearing these gravitational waves. They don't just come to Earth. So going back to the idea of GW150914, the very, very first one that was ever detected, the first confirmation of gravitational waves, it was kind of a big deal. 
Uh, it happened in the same year as the 100 year anniversary of Einstein's publication of his general theory of relativity when he first estimated that gravitational waves might be a thing. It was a big deal on talk shows, lots of stories worldwide. There were, it was trending on Twitter and everyone was talking about it. And the very least, everyone in the scientific community was talking about it. So this might've been where or if you had started hearing about gravitational waves. And it made a big impact, especially in pop culture. So now you can actually get the detection of GW 59 and 14 on cups and hats and clocks and pillows and shirts. It was featured on the Big Bang Theory if you watch that Sheldon Moore, look at his shirt. And you can also get it in other uh, very fashionable pieces of clothing, such as this dress. <laughs> There's no limit. <laughs> uh, the detection of gravitational waves led to a lot of prizes and recognition for all the work that was put into it through the LIGO scientific collaboration, as well as some of its collaborators. Uh, they won the Breakthrough Prize, Science, the Gruber Prize, all of these things. But most notably, it was the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2017 uh, from what's considered usually the three founding fathers of the LIGO scientific collaboration and some of its affiliates, Rainer Weiss, Barry C. Barish, and Kip S. Thorne. So talking about gravitational waves and hearing them, I want to kind of reinforce why, how hard it can be to listen for these gravitational waves. Uh, LIGO didn't just turn on in 2015 and hear the gravitational waves. There was decades, tens of years of work uh, behind trying to build these instruments and make sure we knew what gravitational waves looked like before we started listening for them and being able to parse the data that came in from LIGO in order to confirm that that was a detection. On top of that, people have been working on gravitational wave theory since 1916 or 1915 when Albert Einstein first published his theory of general relativity. So I just want to highlight that we do an activity that you can try at home for black hole hunters. Uh, in a very short way of describing it, you have three groups. So you're going to need at least three people, hopefully more. One group are the black hole hunters, one group, are the, one group is the black holes, and the third group is the noise. So the idea is that everyone goes to opposite sides of the room. Uh, you're as far away from each other as you possibly can be. The black holes decide on a phrase and can be anything you want. It could be Baba Black Sheep, it could be the cow goes moo, whatever you want could be your phrase, as long as you decide on it together, um, the black holes rather. The black hole hunters don't know the phrase and neither do the noise. So the black holes, they say your phrase at a regular speaking volume. Noise, you be noisy. You clap and you stomp and you sing and you say other phrases and your goal is to try and make sure that the black hole hunters don't hear the phrase. The black hole hunters facing away from the black holes try and figure out what that phrase is. Um, and there's different, there's different versions of the activity available on the PDF on the website. So I really encourage you guys to try that out to have an idea of how important knowing what you're looking for is when you have a template of what to look for versus when you don't. I think that'll be a really fun activity for you guys to try. So and taking a pause to answer some more of these questions. Um, Can we use our senses against gravitation against gravitational waves? Uh, gravitational waves aren't bad, by the way. They're they're really exciting and they're good. <laughs> so I think I think you mean can you use other senses to detect gravitational waves? And that's an interesting question because we actually can't detect gravitational waves as human beings. We need very sensitive detectors to um, detect them at all to know that they're there. So we use the phrase "listen for gravitational waves" because gravitational waves actually. Um, as I, as I mentioned, when they move through space time, not on top of it, we can't really say that we see them because we don't. Uh, so it's more like hearing than it is seeing. You don't use a telescope, you use an interferometer. So we use the term hearing instead of seeing just because that makes a little bit more sense uh, when we think about how the detectors work. Um, so I, we can't really say, you can't touch a gravitational wave, for example, no more than you could touch a star. Um, we did not hear gravitational waves before machines. We, Albert Einstein theorized that they were there in 1915 or 1916. And people really worked really hard on the theory behind it. So a lot of mathematical equations, a lot of calculations, but they could not, um, you, you couldn't detect them until, until 2015 when LIGO saw the very first one. Um, gravitational waves do not make galaxies move and rotate. Uh, they do cause ripples in space time and for those galaxies. So you'll have a similar ripple that we saw um, in Earth, but 
but they certainly don't make the galaxies rotate. That is a whole different thing. Gravity, however, will cause galaxies to move and rotate. So gravitational waves are caused by gravity, but gravity is its own thing. And then the other questions of how many gravitational waves happen every year, I first want to highlight that we've actually seen a lot of gravitational waves, over 50, in fact. Um, and so I'm going to leave you guys with one of the other major detections that happened, because we haven't only been seeing gravitational waves from black holes. We've also seen gravitational waves from neutron stars. I'm not going to get into what neutron stars are at this moment. They are similarly compact objects, a lot of mass or matter in one space. But it, we did see, um, and this is where it gets important, we saw and heard this particular uh, gravitational wave event, um, 170817. And this is really important because we heard it in gravitational waves and saw it through telescopes. And that gave us a lot of information about the universe itself, as well as where gravitational waves and other ast astronomical phenomena come from, events that we didn't know what was happening before. And this really gave us a, a new understanding of that. So I'm going to leave you with a simulation of what this particular event looked like. Now remember, we've seen over 50 gravitational waves so far. And as LIGO and Virgo keep operating, they'll continue to see more. We also need to continue calculating what these things look like, like these simulations I just showed. You can certainly find out more about LIGO following the links on the website. In particular, you can go to www.ligo.org to get a full update on what detections have already happened, as well as some of their updates in terms of science updates, educational um, activities and resources and more. Um, so if we have another couple of minutes, I'll just answer the last few questions that came through here that I didn't get to originally. Um, how many gravitational waves happen every year? It's hard to say how many happen every year. We have seen over 50 and it kind of more so relates to how often can you have those detectors keep running. Um, then they need to shut down for upgrades and cleaning and all this stuff as well. So I don't know the number right off my head, but you know where you could find that number, www.ligo.org, because <laughs> that is exactly what they do. Is there an end to the universe? Oh, these are cosmology questions. <laughs> um, We estimate that they're, uh, you know what? I'm gonna leave that question, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not a cosmologist and I would not want to say something that's completely incorrect. Um, Cause, but that's a tricky question, very good, a very good question. How big are gravitational waves? So gravitational waves are really, really loud or really, really big, really close to the source or really close to those black holes that create them. But when they finally get to um, Earth, they tend to be very, very small. And as we said much earlier on, about one 1,000 at the size of a proton. Um, which is like, if you know about scientific notation, uh, 10 to the negative 21 meters. It's, it's very, very small, very small. And how many gravitational waves are in the sun? Uh, so I can interpret that more than one way. So I can interpret that as how many gravitational waves are passing through the sun. And when we talked about what causes gravitational waves earlier, in, an infinite number because there's lots of matter moving around and everything, any kind of matter or mass moving through space time creates gravitational waves. Um, so lots move through the sun. In terms of how many does the sun create? That's a hard question. So you can either think infinite because there's lots of stuff in the sun that's moving uh, that can cause gravitational waves. But then in terms of is the sun in a system with other things that could create gravitational waves like two black holes orbiting around each other or two neutron stars orbiting around each other, um, nothing that would be strong enough to detect. Uh, the sun is, even though the sun is really, really big and has a lot of mass and is much more, is much larger than the earth, it, um, it's not quite massive enough or compact enough to make strong gravitational waves. There are gravitational waves in other galaxies. Uh, the same way that any matter moving through space time anywhere at all in the universe will create gravitational waves. And when gravitational waves are um, caused by binary black holes or compact objects orbiting around each other, uh, they're emitted equally in all directions. So the gravitational waves that we see on Earth could also be seen from other galaxies if there were civilizations there that could detect them. How long does it take gravitational waves to reach Earth? Ooh, that's a good question. So that 
more so depends on um, how far away was the source. So remember, we talked about how fast gravitational waves probably move. We think they travel at the speed of light. And for the sake of this argument, we'll say that that's true. They travel at the speed of light. Uh, so then a better question in terms of how far they, how far, how far away they are, we could say how many light years away uh, was that binary black hole? And then you can think about how long does it take to reach us? Uh, 150914 or GW 15914, the very first detection that was ever discovered um, was said to be about 1.3 billion light years away. And light years is how far light takes to travel in one year. So flip that around. Typically on the order of millions or billions of years to get to Earth. Um, that will change based on the detection because of course different systems will emit different gravitational waves and as our detectors get more and more sensitive we'll be able to see more and more or hear more and more rather um, the answer to that question will change with time uh, and again i really highly recommend checking out ligo.org to get more updated information on that thank you so much charles that was a very interesting um subject um like recent science uh, lots of good questions you guys were great i mean this is not the easiest subject you know don't hear about that in school that much but the fact that it was you know a big discovery in the last few years really really cutting edge science we thought it would be interesting to share so thanks a lot charles for sharing that with us You're more than welcome <laughs> um and just a bit of information um we will be back on monday we're taking the weekend off we will be back on monday uh with different subjects we will have on monday we're talking about astronomy news so things you might have heard about recently we'll try to cover them we have different speakers next week we'll talk about evolution of stars as well and i see charles you disappeared sorry i just i just wanted to say a few things that i was gonna talk to you again in a minute <laughs> um also thank you for coming back so thanks so you Hi. know we you can always watch the recording uh if you missed one so thanks for those of you who are there live but if you missed one and if you're watching the recording for this one you can go back we have been doing this i believe this is day nine um so we've been doing it for uh, quite a few days already lots of great videos online you can watch uh thanks a lot for your questions lots of great questions on this topic i thought it was great and uh, just so you know we will put links so charles you mentioned the activity and a few links we will put those in the description of the youtube video in as soon as i can and uh, just to mention quickly next week so you've heard me mention lindsay quite a few times lindsay is in the background moderating the chat and doing a lot of stuff next week she will be the one hosting so you'll see her it won't be me it will be lindsay next week so thanks again for being there today everyone thank you charles again for presenting that and uh, you can say something otherwise they won't see you yeah it was i'm more than happy to present i hope everyone enjoyed it <laughs> yeah so i just wanted to for you to say like a goodbye and uh yeah thanks out everyone and uh, we'll be back next week <laughs>